Okay, great. We're so excited to have all of you here with us today for, um, for this conference. And I wanted to just mention that I've known Deb for a long time. And uh, Deb, we don't see each other as often as I'd like to, but I count you in as one of my, um, I wouldn't say close friends, but certainly important acquaintances. And I, I personally asked for you, Deb, to come oh, today. Goodness. Oh, no pressure. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. And Deb, um, I, can I just say a little bit about you? Um, Deb, Deb Al Alsi um, is the coordinator of multilingual student programs um, an advisor to the Campus Multicultural Club at Penn State's program in Brandywine. Um, she received her uh, BA uh, in English from Loyola and her master's from Westchester. And she's previously taught in Thailand and she loves to travel. She's been all over Europe and countries in Asia. But the thing that I wanna tell you what's personal to me is her book on teaching developmental immigrant students in undergraduate programs. And Deb, I remember when you did a presentation for us at Holy Family on that book, mm -hmm. and I still have it, and it's very meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Deb addresses the academic and holistic needs of a growing multilingual student population by sharing practices that she used in her Penn State Brandywine's highly successful multilingual student course cluster. And her latest publication is co-authored. Uh, she has a chapter that discusses a partnership between her multilingual first year composition students and pre-service teachers in Westchester, this university's MATSL program. Um, and without uh, taking up too much time, I just wanted to reinforce that um, her, her presentation perfectly aligns with our theme, the power of the pen, amplifying the voices of second language writers. And Deb's presentation will be called Finding Our Voices, empowering multilingual students inside and outside the classroom. So uh, without further ado, Deb, we're so delighted to have you. Uh, I'll turn the uh, speaker over to you. Thank you, thank you so much, Leslie. I really appreciate that. It's so good to see you in person. I was on the board was on the with PTE and it's just, it's neat to see you and I can't wait for more in-person conferences as great as this is. So um, I hope everyone is stretching, grabbing their snack. I'm gonna, there's, I was really enjoyed Keith's presentation, obviously, um, but there's so many different things to talk about with writing. So I'm kind of go, going to go a little in a different direction. Uh, so I will share my screen here um, and start this from the beginning. All right, so hopefully we're all good. Everyone can see. Um, so my presentation um, is entitled Finding Our Voices, Empowering Multilingual Students Inside and Outside the Classroom. Uh, as Leslie said, my name is Deb Uzi. I teach at Penn State Brandywine. Uh, to give a little background on myself, um, I've taught at Brandywine. I've, I've been there in some capacity for, gosh, 25 years now. I was a, a writing tutor, um, and then I, I taught part-time, and now for the last about eight years, I've been the coordinator of multilingual and international student programs, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, I have a picture here of Remedy International School, which is um, a school in Bangkok that I taught in my first teaching job right out of college. Um, on my phone interview there, the, the um, the uh, the principal uh, told me, oh, they're they're non-native speakers, but you just teach them like everybody else. And then I learned, well, that's not really exactly true, and that got me into wanting to uh, study TESOL. And it took me uh, eight years through Westchester's program, one class at a time, and two babies to uh, finally get that degree. But anyway, so that's kind of my path, and I put a couple of the my publications just up in the corner in case anyone was interested. Okay, so. Where are we going here? There we are. Okay, so about Penn State Brandywine, just it, Penn State Brandywine is one of the branch campuses of Penn State University. We have 1300 students. We're located outside Media, Pennsylvania. We're in a suburb outside of Philly. So we have both urban and suburban students. We have students from very wealthy districts. We have students from very um, economically impoverished districts. Uh, one really fantastic thing about our campus is that uh, from a survey a few years ago, we found that one in five students speaks a language other than English at home, which is a tremendous amount. We have a tremendous amount of um, immigrant students or um, students who are uh, Generation 1.5, you would say, so 
uh, second generation um, or live in um, different uh, linguistic enclaves. We have a growing international student uh, population. Uh, we're getting back to our pre-COVID levels, hopefully this fall, pretty close to it. Uh, we generally have about 35 students that are here with um, different visas that, that classify as that type of international. So we have some students that have come over here just to study English and we have others that have come here with their families a while ago. And as you know, that takes you know, different teaching strategies, sometimes different needs. We have a, a 250 bed residence hall, so we're mostly commuter, but we are attracting more um, international students because of our residence hall. And we, we actually have approximately 60 countries represented on our campus. We have students from all over. I think Abington is the only campus uh, from Penn State that, that beats us on that number. All right, so my role, I have a really, really, really cool job. I have a, my job title is Coordinator of Multilingual and International Student Programs. So I teach half time. Um, and the other half, I get to work with students um, and get to know them a different way. I run international student orientation. I'm kind of the, the, the mentor and guide for the international students that are arriving. I run a lot of programming. I work with students to do a lot of cultural programming on our campuses, things like a Chinese banquet, or to also to do some American things such as a, a Thanksgiving feast with halal turkey and all that kind of stuff. So, I, and we I run a lot of trips off campus, things like that. I also co-coordinate our multilingual student course cluster, which is a um, cluster of courses for students uh, for whom English is, is an additional language. I, I teach an English course in that. Uh, we also have a American history and culture course and we have a, a, um, a uh, international literature and film course, which I also teach and some other, other courses in there. Um, and I'm, I am an assistant teaching professor of English. So what really attracted me to this, um, to this, this, this conference and what really got me when, when I was invited was this, this the, the words amplify and voices. The fact that this was called, um, the, the conference was talking about amplifying uh, the voices of second language writers. And, you know, I guess as a teacher, as a, you know, I always had this attraction to the idea of voice um, and helping students to find their voice and, and, you know, teaching them to fish, you know, getting your voice. Um, and also just amplifying, just such a positive thing. So I really started thinking about these. I was really latching on to these words. And amplify, you know, that's easy, right? Amplify, first de definition, it makes larger, greater, stronger. Yes, we're going under vocabulary a little bit here. Um, so that's simple. But voices, voices is much more complicated. There's a lot, there's a lot of connotation to that. There are a lot of different ways we use that. Um, but I think it's something that I, I think we all value as English teachers. So I'd like to take a second here and just kind of get you involved a little bit and talk about maybe some of your um, connections with that word. Uh, so I'm going to use, I know we have the chat, but I'm going to use um, this poll everywhere, which I like to use with my students sometimes because I think some of the students that um, don't, um, aren't as as likely to raise their hands or share something. Again, it's another way to give students a voice. Um, here's, uh, so here's, um, this is called poll every, I'm sorry, I started checking the chat. I gotta stop doing that. Um, I will check that at the end. But if you want, if you'd like to try this, you can do this on your phone or in another window. Um, but I'd like to just kind of demonstrate a little bit some of the um, brainstorming techniques that I use and also just get us thinking about what is what does student voice mean to us? What does a voice mean to you? So you can either text it or you can um, enter it in on the um, like on in, the, in the browser on that web address up there. So just if you could just take a second and, and answer this. So we get a few answers up here. What, what does the word voice make you think of? What do you associate with a voice? Can you see that screen that I just put up the, the I don't know whether when I did that, I, I, it's visible or not. Yes. Yes, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. Anybody have a phone nearby? Put in a little idea here. Let's see. There we go. All right, point of view. All right. Someone else said tone, but they didn't put it in the, this I should be texting you then too. Oh, okay. So people are, are being very literal with the idea of voice. Any other associations with voice? Uh, 
Ah, gosh, I thought this was going to be doing as a word cloud. That's OK. OK, self-expression. Yep, definitely, definitely self-expression. Or two more. No, oh, OK, so the people are putting more in the chat here, too. OK, yep, style and organization. All right. OK. So a lot of kind of we're really thinking about voice in terms of oh narratives telling your story yep definitely first person third person so a lot of people are really taking it from the English teacher use of voice vocabulary choice you're getting really literal about you know the the, the voice of a writer there are there any more broad um, connections okay being heard yep expressing a personal opinion okay so I'm gonna um, escape out of this. And I think because we are in, so I've kind of demonstrated this a little bit. So I'll go back to, I'm gonna close this. I'm gonna go back to my uh, PowerPoint here. And let, I, I'm gonna ask my next question um, in the chat because I think it is easier in the chat in this format. I just wanted to kind of show you that tool because I, I think it's a good way to get students to, to kind of be able to anonymously participate. So the other question I have, um, and we can just use the chat for this now too, is um, what what do you think of when I when if what does it mean to um, to have a voice? What does it mean to have a voice? What does it mean to have a voice? To have something important to share, to have some strength, to be able to share an opinion. You're important in the room. There you go. So once we start adding to that voice, everybody's got advocacy. You listen to the meaning behind it. Oh, everybody's, everybody's into this. This is what we want. This is what our students to have, to be part of the conversation, to speak your truth, articulate it, have it understood as you intend it. Wow, have the right to have, yeah, this works much better on Zoom, doesn't it? Okay, or, okay, so there you go. So, and then the last one, what does it mean to find your voice? What does it mean to find your voice, right? Yep, you're getting confidence. Yep, you're gonna discover things. Cool, uncover, have the language necessary to express yourself, yep. Awesome. Okay, so I know become aware of your values. Share. Okay, all kinds of great values kind of things. So awesome, awesome. I just wanted to kind of throw that out there to get us thinking. Um, because, you know, as I was thinking about this, finding your voice can mean so many different things. And I think as, as writing teachers and as um, teachers of multilingual students, we're helping students find their voices in so many ways outside of just the grammar and the style and all those kind of things. Um, for multilingual students, identity is such a key issue. I work with college level students and every college student is trying to figure out who they are but and what they believe. And, and it's, it's doubly difficult when you have one cultural influence at home and another one at school. So identity is a huge one. Self-expression, which a lot of people brought up. So gaining that ability to express your thoughts, express your opinions, which in a lot of cultures and a lot of teaching such as school situations in a lot of cultures is not expected or valued. You're supposed to kind of the teacher is the expert and you're just kind of taking it in. And this idea of sharing your opinions is, is really, you know, different and, and, and not a cultural value um, that students come in with a lot of times. Self-esteem, you know, feeling like what you say has value and, and that you're worthwhile. Core beliefs, again, you're figuring out your beliefs and when you're kind of contrasting these two different cultures or multiple cultures that you're, you're living in among between. Um, finding your voice means that you feel like you're part of the community. And we know that there's a lot of research on how a sense of belonging is so essential to students' academic success and persistence and graduation rates and everything else. It's just the big buzzword, you know, sense of belonging. Um, once you find your voice, you can become a leader. Um, once you find your voice, you can become an agent for change. You can bring about change. So these are all these things that happen from finding your voice. So your student kind of finding their voice in the classroom and in writing can then kind of snowball or build into all these other things as well. At least that's the way I see it. Um, and that's been my experience of being able to work both with students inside and outside the classroom. Okay, um, I'm realizing that I'm not sharing my full screen anymore. Hold on. Um, let me, let me, 
All right, let me see if that, there we go, that's prettier. Okay, so reasons multilingual students may, wait, I think I might've just missed, yep, okay, I got it. Okay, reasons multilingual students may feel that they don't have a voice. Um, sometimes, and you all know this as teachers, I'm just kind of reminding that we all kind of are on the same page here. Um, you know, that a lot of times students in our classrooms are unfamiliar or uncomfortable with cultural expectations and values. They're unfamiliar or uncomfortable with teaching style and the educational system. They're not fluent or um, they're uncomfortable in English, unfamiliar with regional English expressions or vocabulary as Keith was talking about with us, those kind of things. All these things causing the student really stand back and feel kind of powerless. Having a voice means having power in a lot of ways. And again, like I was saying, you're trying to figure out who they are. Um, and also you don't know what kind of home situations and everything else are going on too. So a lot of times you're, you're dealing with, you have students in your class that don't feel like they have a voice. Um, despite that, it looks like it only wants me to click, okay. Um, but we do know that in spite of all the challenges they face, um, and perhaps because of them, um, English language learners can be viewed as advantaged in certain ways. They have a lot of important skills and dispositions that monolingual and multicultural students may lack. I'm sure you, you, there's research on how students um, who speak one or more, more than one language are more creative thinkers. They are able to, to handle differences more. They think more in gray than black and white. Um, I know it sounds like a generalization, but there are some multilingual students that have a different attitude toward education or a, a, a different work ethic. That kind of thing sometimes happens too. So there's there are a, lot of, a lot of positives and there's a lot of background knowledge that our students have. Um, and they're experts in a lot of things. Okay, so here are some of my thoughts on um, and, and my experiences with what can help multilingual students find their voices. I, and so some of my suggestions and my experiences are that readings, discussions, and responses that reflect student experiences. We'll go, I'm gonna, this is basically the outline of what I'm gonna touch on today. Um, by having, we all know that, um, that representation is important, right? So, but to think about that in terms of not only what the readings are, but also that there, we then discuss and, and expand on those readings to allow all these different student experiences and perspectives to kind of have value. Um, topic choices. I was in, uh, Terry Stiles had a good session today on um, topic choices and how that empowers students. And we'll talk about that a bit. Um, brainstorming. Brainstorming, I think, is kind of underlooks uh, sometimes the importance of getting students to really think out all their ideas and, and have those ideas kind of validated and talked through and, and kind of developed before they start writing. Uh, publication, of course, that's really, you know, that's, that's the big reward. And I think we, we need to do that as often as we can with students. Creating opportunities for students to be the experts and share perspectives. This can be within class, um, between classes, uh, for the whole campus, the whole school, um, and meaningful involvement in leadership and change. So I'm going to go through these and, and talk about, from my experience or my teaching um, perspective, I know that you know different people are teaching in different contexts, but I'm hoping that today that I, I'm an idea person. So I'm hoping that I give a lot of ideas and um, at the end, everyone else is also sharing their ideas and that we can kind of think of ways to maybe adapt these at different levels, different, um, different educational settings, that kind of stuff. So I don't know, I got this little fancy thing in there I didn't think I added, but uh, the first one, readings, discussions and responses that reflect student ex experiences. So I'm just gonna share some of the, the readings, the media that I've used in various classes that I've really found that students have related to, that I've really gotten, I think good discussion um, from students from all different backgrounds. It not just not just the the background that's actually maybe of the of the author of the of the reading, but that gets everyone talking and sharing their own experiences. And I think my favorite thing I did um, this year it was in my um, introduction my um, it, uh, international literature and film class, a comparative literature and film class, was that we read um, Crying in H Mart. We did not read the whole book. Um, I do highly recommend it if you have not seen it. And um, I, I, I think it's turning into a movie. I don't, don't quote me on that. But I know that um, Crying in H Mart, uh, what we read 
um, the original, the first chapter of the book originally um, showed up as an essay in, um, in uh, the New Yorker. And it's about, basically, it's about, um, Michelle is about, she's like 25, her mother just, just passed away, her mother's Korean, her, her father is Caucasian American. And so she's finding herself crying in H Mart and she's from Philly, she was in Philly at the time, she went to Bryn Mawr. So like, there's all that kind of connection there. My students really love that part. Um, but this, this how H Mart really, um, how, how her connection with food was so powerful a connection to her culture and how losing her mom made her feel like she was going to lose that whole half of her culture. And we got in, we, I brought in Korean food from H Mart that day and students really um, started sharing their own experiences with, um, with food and memory in their countries and their cultures and then with their sense of identity and and who they are, what they believe. So it's just, it's a great starting point for a discussion and conversation uh, where students can really have a voice and share their own experiences. Um, I'll go a little more quickly over some of the other ones. Um, Mother Tongue, Amy Tan, talking about her mother's quote unquote broken English. My English, Julia Alvarez, about what it was like to learn English. And my favorite line from there is that she came into the US at the age of, I think it was 10 or 12. And she thought everyone, it's such a smart country because even the um, taxi drivers know English. So that that idea that we associate English with intelligence and, and how ridiculous and all that kind of stuff. So there's a few others um, here. I can highlight uh, Chim Amanda Dietschy's The Power of a Single Story. A lot of you probably know that um, TED Talk. It's pretty, pretty spectacular. Uh, Jamaica Kincaid's uh, prose poem, Girl, is a set of rules a mother has for a daughter. Again, that makes a great writing assignment where students can really write about what rules are in their head, what rules do they have to follow. Um, and we just really enjoy um, school swap Korea style. There's a the Welsh students attending a Korean school and learning about the Korean education system, which again, gets a lot of discussion about what education is like in a lot of different countries. So again, these are all things that really can get students that they can kind of share their own experiences, their own, they kind of, feel like they have a voice because they're sharing their own background knowledge and their own experiences. Uh, the second one is topic choices. Again, I did attend um, Terry's sections, uh, session this morning on, on topic choices. Um, and she actually quoted <laughs> so the same, one of the same researchers I am. Oops, sorry, I went backwards too far. Um, but basically there's, there is research um, that students perceive, them, uh, perceive themselves to be more motivated and encouraged to write when they're granted the right to choose their own topic. Um, although not all students say, that, um, say this, so some researchers suggest that you should give the choice of pick your own topic or here are a few ideas, which I always, I always kind of do it that way. Um, we also got into the, the, the discussion this morning about, you know, sometimes you, you can't pick anything out of the blue, but if a, an instructor just even gives two different choices from two different readings or two different questions about the same reading or the same um, topic, it kind of gives students a little bit more agency to choose what they feel like they have the voice, they want to say in their voice. Um, and there's also research that there, you do have more stronger writing performance and academic performance if you students selected the topic. So something to think about. So some of the things that I've used with um, topic choices, there's a wonderful website, um, thisibelieve.org. And uh, this I believe, it actually was a radio show in the 50s first, uh, where people would record, would talk for like three minutes about something they deeply believe in. It has to be something they believe in, not something they don't believe in. And there are lots of, lots of essays on the site. Some are funny, some are serious, some are um, by famous people, some are by everyday people. But that's a wonderful assignment. They even have guidelines on how to write this to get students to write about what they believe. And I think that's really important for students that aren't used to having to express their own opinion um, and that they can, they can give some specific examples from their own experiences. It's a good kind of essay to kind of get students thinking about that. I've done uh, definition essays where students have to think about a word. They have to define things in a lot of classes for a lot of ways, but um, do an extended definition on a word that is meaningful to them. Uh, I've done photo essays, which are fantastic. Um, it used to be called Adobe Spark. It is now Adobe um, Express. 
but it is a, a wonderful, um, easy way uh, to make a website. You could use sites at google.com, something like that. But students using their own photos to tell their story of how they came to the US or a hobby that they're interested in. It doesn't always have to be something cultural. You know, I mean, certainly if, if they're into anime or they're a great soccer player or whatever, you know, let them share their interests. Um, you know, stamp collecting, I don't know, whatever, but just give students um, a little agency to kind of explore something that way. I had a wonderful one on that explained henna um, tattoos. I've, I've had a lot of really interesting essays, things of students into cooking, whatever. Um, another suggestion is, um, yeah, and someone just put in the, the, the chat that it could be high or low tech doing uh, photo essays. Um, I've also had students um, talk on things where they just pasted a photo in a PowerPoint, like just to make it a slide and that was it and just talked about that photo. So it doesn't have to be a whole essay. It could be something simple, but it, it makes it more personal. It helps them, you know, build community. Students ask about each of those things. It really does build a lot of community. Um, problem solution essays, that's a good way if you're teaching research and citing sources and things like that. Students can talk about a local issue, a problem in the US or in another country, um, but their problem solution they get really interested in because maybe they see a problem in the US or maybe there's something they wanna share that way. Um, reflective essays, um, essays about students' names or, or even just sharing about their name, the significance of the name. Uh, most, I, I think Americans are, are somewhat unique in how, how many American students say, oh, my parents just like the name. But if you really ask them, even that they can kind of um, get some really interesting stories. And I always share first uh, meanings of my name and, and what it's associated with and how I feel about my name and things like that. Um, so that's, that's always a fun one to do. Um, and I should say that I teach students, I teach um, mixed courses. So I do have native, domestic students in my classes, native um, speaking English students in my classes, as well as multilingual students. So we, we do that kind of sharing um, all the time. So it works with both. Um, and then choosing, as I said before, choosing a different, maybe having more than one writing prompt and letting a cho student choose one to have some kinds of agency there. Okay, let's see what else here. Uh, the next idea, Plenty and plenty and plenty of brainstorming and feedback and discussion of brainstorming and validating these ideas the student has and asking more questions and having conversations about it. Um, I love brainstorming. I think it's one of the most important um, parts um, to really help a student figure out what they want to say. I mean, of course, I love graphic organizers too, but that initial like coming up with stuff and, and knowing what's important to them is just such a great part of being an English teacher. Um, so some things that you've, you've kind of seen um, before, you, you probably already do in your class about having students fill out something or answer questions or free write or brainstorm in some way, and share it with a partner or a group, all that kind of stuff. Um, one thing I like to do, um, especially when we're brainstorming for a topic, I'm going to see if I can, hopefully, tell me if you, can, if you can't see this, but I'm going to, I have to click this way. But I have, um, I share a Google Doc with a lot of different ideas of what, um, so I have the Google Doc up here now, hopefully you can see that, that um, types of problems, problems faced by people my age, problems in my neighborhood or community, problems in the US, all these different types of problems, right? So I leave this as a Google Doc and I let all the students work together on it at the same time. And as they're doing it, we discuss it or I'll pull one out and we'll just start talking about ways that could work or, oh, that's a neat idea. And, and when they do that, it gets more and more students to share because you're validating their ideas and their voices and their opinions and things like that. And we talk about ways, you know, that really could be a good topic um, because the assignment is they need to choose it. Um, explain why it's a problem and then just uh, explore, discuss possible solutions and then kind of say what they think the best solution or combination of solutions is. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff, you know, that comes out. Um, violence and you know, how do you stop violence in your neighborhood? What about social media, body image? There are a lot of interesting ones, problems in the United States, obesity, right? The pink tax, they came up with lots of ideas. And some of them are, are vague in general, like why they keep hating. But that leads to a discussion on how to narrow the topic. But I, I've just found that this kind of um, 
kind of anonymous. I mean, you got to be careful because sometimes somebody will just type whatever they want to type, you know, um, but this kind of anonymous brainstorming um, with a lot of reinforcement really kind of gets students to um, be more comfortable sharing. Um, other things that I, I do with brainstorming, um, polleverywhere.com, I showed that a little bit, um, providing lots of samples. Documentary trailers are sometimes really good ideas for um, good ways to kind of show topics in a snippets of different topics. You know, there's there's one I linked here and, and this um, document will be available to you on the, the PowerPoint will be available to you on um, the, Pentiesel's website, but that documentary tra uh, trailer, I, I linked one on the, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, a big bunch of plastic island floating in the middle of the ocean. So students can watch little trailers like that and get a good sense of what the issues are and then maybe decide if there's something they want to explore. Um, library databases have lots of topics. Um, I always have students meet with a librarian after they've initially brainstorm, they meet one-on-one -on -one and they go through databases together when it's a research paper. Uh, the New York Times has a lot of great educational resources, a lot of things where they use um, their articles and, and things like that, that, that are really targeted to students if you haven't seen that. Um, and I really, I really think it's important to be consulting with the students and, and you know, really validating their ideas and questioning their ideas and having discussions. Um, about it before you know, they start writing, before they start their graphic organizing or whatever they're, they're planning um, to help students figure out how to narrow ideas, um, that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, so let's see one more thing here. So, and after the topic selection too, there are lots of things um, we do. We brainstorm as a whole class to get students used to sharing ideas and just showing validating ideas and, and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, we, we brainstorm and pre-write a whole, uh, organize a um, hypothetical piece of writing. Um, a lot of times I, I tell students that when you, uh, like writing, the difference between writing and speaking is that in speaking, people can ask you questions, right? And they, when they ask you questions, you can tell them more, you can give them more information, you can find out what gaps you've, what things you've missed. But when you write, you have to anticipate all that. So pairing students up and having them talk, um, take notes for each other sometimes. One person talks, the other person just takes notes. Um, anything like that can really help them kind of develop their ideas. Uh, I always make submitting brainstorming or completed graphic organizer required step in the assignment. And we discuss a lot of samples um, ahead of time. Okay. Oh, my favorite, 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 uh, I think students favorite thing, I think sometimes is seeing their work in publication. And I think that really validates a student's voice. It really shows that what they have to say is important. Um, you know, one story I can tell is that my very first job um, was at Rumor D International School in Bangkok. And one of the things I was hired to do was to revise the, re, 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 revitalize, um, breathe more life into the dying school newspaper. So I had four students um, in my newspaper class that fall. And then the next semester it became a full class. I, I got lots of students to join. But by the end of the year, we had 75 contributors and a full staff of like 20 some students. And a part of that is because I, I let students write about whatever they wanted. And um, if any of you have know the whole circuit for um, teaching um, at international schools, a lot of times there are married couples or couples that will every two years move from one school to the other. That's kind of their, their way to see the world, right? So we had a lot of couples in our school. So uh, Valentine's, February comes around and the headline is teacher love secrets, right? And so everybody had all that, you know, they, they interviewed about the teaching, um, you know, the, what are the teacher's love stories? And I'm like, you know, it's getting them writing. It's something they're interested in. It made them feel, you know, they were rock stars for publishing the, the, the interview about how these teachers met or whatever. So that kind of thing is great. Submitting, encouraging students, and you have to invite them. You have to really encourage students to submit to the school literary journal. And a lot of my assignments lend themselves to be submitted that way. Um, I've gotten students to enter writing contests. Uh, Penn State has a best of freshman writing. It should be called first year writing probably by now, but best of freshman writing where I'll, I'll submit students' papers. 
um, online things, all kinds of stuff like that. Having students make their own websites or having a student club, building a club and having them publish things, newsletters. Um, I also, um, I guess this isn't the student writing, but I, another thing I do is I contact our, uh, uh, our Office of Strategic Communications and they write a lot of news stories about my students and things that they do and put them up on the website. So that's another way of kind of validating and giving a voice. Um, pen pals or you know something like that between classes or um, between I have a, a colleague who pairs her students with um, students in a university in a con another con some a country in South Africa South America I'm not sure which I don't remember which one but just, just that kind of thing um, every time a writing assignment is finished I'll share um, student writing. Um, here are a few things students from our class wrote uh, using different students every time, getting their permission first. So they get it, you know, get to hear what other people say, and it's kind of kind of neat to do that. Um, using discussion boards, bulletin boards, lots and lots of stuff. So I just really encourage, you know, to give a student a voice, empower the student any way to publish, any way to get it out there, and especially to be publishing alongside. Um, the native speaking students is also, you know, kind of a, a big thrill. Um, you know, it's just to say, oh, I was in the literary journal or whatever. So I, I really do um, encourage that. Okay, let's see what else I got here. Okay, so I put not much cultural on the bottom here um, to to kind of remind us that yes, it's really important to have students, you know, share their culture in a way that's natural and share their experiences. But students are not just their culture. So, I mean, there are things students, this student might be into poke, yeah, I don't wanna say, well, not at my level, hopefully, but, or uh, they might be into like Dungeons and Dragons or Pokemon cards or graphic novels or all kinds of other things. So, you know, this should be any student interest. Um, so some ways to do that. Providing various perspectives on a reading, um, having them reflect on a reading, discussion boards, with some of the readings I shared before. So that's obviously having a lot of discussions and or written discussions, out loud discussions, small group discussions where they can share uh, perspectives and they know they're in a space where that's validated. Um, linking with another class is great. Um, we have uh, a professor who teaches um, ed an education course for students who want to be teachers. And so we will have, I will have students from my class come in and talk about education, what education was like in their countries. And they love sharing that. And the, um, the students in the course love learning it. And they, it just, it's a really a win-win. And I've done that with other courses too. There are global studies courses where um, instructors, other instructors have asked if maybe our two classes could meet together one time and talk on the same topic. Um, it's something that the, the students can give a global perspective to. I just think that's a fantastic way for students to be interacting with, with native speakers, with, um, you know, with the whole campus community and being a part of that whole campus community. Um, one thing I really love to do as part of my position as a coordinator of multilingual and international student programs is that I host global dialogues. Where, and that's a picture there of one of the global dialogues where students will um, basically, and I'll share in a minute some of the topic ideas, but students will um, uh, talk on a, a topic of interest that, that, or a professor will lead a discussion. Either the professor will lead a discussion, just ask lots of questions, or sometimes students will share some pictures on slides or do a little presentation and then they'll have a discussion. But um, they'll talk about anything from what's dating like in my culture or my country, uh, to music tastes, to um, how's COVID being handled in this country, to, I'll show you some of the topics and lots. And again, that you'll have this PowerPoint. Um, sharing, celebrating holidays with the class, the entire school, um, being part of a school-wide engagement fair. We had an engagement fair um, this year where everyone from the, the clubs and the art department and the research and all these, every, every student engagement piece, internships, everything was in the same place on our campus this year in one big expo. So we had a bunch of tables of um, the international multilingual students. And here's this group of students that decided to have an Eid celebration on campus for the entire campus. And they had a table showing what they did and videos of their dance and lots of stuff. Um, and I had the, the Multicultural Club had a table and other students who did something else had a table. So just really letting students showcase 
um, and publishing and presenting on a topic of expertise. Uh, Tara Stiles' uh, presentation this morning, one, one thing that was so cool about it was that two of her students were in the presentation. And I've done that too. Um, I, years ago, I, I did a presentation at the Chester County Intermediate Unit and it was kind of about what the students ask the students, like what, what students tell you what they wish their teacher had known, what their ESL experience was like. And the K-12 teachers that were in that session, it was, it was fascinating because when the students were with them, they might not have verbalized this, but now that they're in college and they're coming back and they're sharing, this is what my educational experience was like, this is what I learned from you. Um, this is what I needed and this is what, you know, that kind of stuff. It was spectacular. And it's just for students to become presenters, I think is, is an incredible experience for them. Okay, let's, what else I have here? Oh, so some sample global dialogue topics. And I know I am being conscious of the time because I do want to have some discussion. Uh, let me see if I can show you this. I'm going to go back to, there we go. Um, yeah, and I just saw someone's comment as is opening. This, I believe, use, I don't know, if, I hope you can publish at thisibelieve.org now. Some, sometimes they close it so you can't publish on it because I've, I've tried to get students to submit on it. If it's open for submissions now, that's fantastic. But I've found some semesters where they, they can't. But um, it was actually the... Um, it was actually the campus read one year for our school. And so we have a, a, a book actually of, of all the students on our campus, a lot of students on our campus. So we published like a journal that way. Anyway, okay, so global dialogue topics. Um, and you can see this in the PowerPoint later, but social media around the world, that's really fun. Students are showing what WeChat is and this and that. And it was just, it's, I had, you know, students walk around from table to table and show their different social media or put it up on the screen. How is US history and news is covered around the world? Um, what, what's it like to, what, how to be healthy? Different countries have different ideas about that. What mental health um, is thought about, how people think about mental health around the world. Music, what I want you to know about my country. How, this was a fun one. How do we decide if someone is good looking? So like beauty standards around the world. So that there's lots of things that students feel very comfortable sharing and talking about and they can speak to um, the entire campus, the entire school or to another class or however you want to do it. Okay, let me, oh, come on. Let me do it from current slide here. Okay, so here's that. Um, let's see. And then, okay, so again, not just cultural, um, but again, this is what I, I, I get to see. I can, this is kind of the culmination I get to see from being able to teach and then also having my role as the coordinator of multilingual and international student programs, but you don't have to have that role in order to kind of, see some of this and do some of this and encourage some of this and partner with others on your campus or school about some of these things. Um, but I, I think it's really important when you, you think about student voices that it's not just that they're able to, you know, express themselves, you know, in a paper for class to get a good grade, but that they can kind of fully um, develop some leadership and some agency for change. Um, as well. So some things um, that my students have done, um, student government positions, we have a diversity chair, we have um, you know, other roles that students have been in. We've had a lot of students that have formed their own clubs. There's an anime club they made, there's a multicultural club they made, um, and they join other ones too. Uh, but that kind, of, that kind of thing is really a way for students to have a voice. We have campus committees that need student representation as well as faculty and staff representation. And we really actively recruit. And this is the thing sometimes with multilingual students, the students that feel like they don't have a voice, that they don't have a footing, is that you have to invite them. And so we invite a lot of these students to be on our campus committees, to be on the, the committee that decides how the student fee is, is spent, or the, the, the committee that, that's talking about racial justice or all those kind of things. Um, I have students in my office that work as peer mentors. We have an additional peer mentor program that's that's not just for international students, and some of my international students are on that as well. Um, students can organize cultural events. I had a group of students just approach me and they said, we really loved the Chinese banquet that, that we had um, on campus and we wanna do a celebration for Eid. And we actually work with campus dining and provide student recipes and they actually are able to make all that. And they had to write up a, 
proposal to get funding and all kinds of stuff. So it really was a good leadership opportunity for them. But it can also be something as simple as hitting the H Mart, getting those international candies out and having a table um, and passing them out um, to promote an event or a club or, or a holiday. Um, we've had moon cakes given out, you know, at certain at lunchtime for um, the autumn, mid, you know, mid autumn festival, all kinds of things like that. But also I've had some students that really have advocated for themselves and this kind of builds. I mean, you see them their first semester and you're starting to express themselves in their writing, but maybe by their sophomore year, um, they're planning each celebrations and they're meeting with um, the head of the residence hall to say, look, it's Ramadan. We need card key access into the kitchen earlier and we need the, you know, we need the ability to be in the kitchen at 4.30 in the morning and we need to be able to get in late at night and all these, these things we need. Um, or students asking for prayer spaces, students asking for um, more. Uh, right now I have a student who's written a letter um, making the case for having halal food regularly in the campus dining hall because right now there's vegetarian food regularly and there's halal for any of my events when I request it, but there is not a regular halal food despite our large Muslim population. So students, you know, there's lots of things that they can do that way. All right, so being conscious of the time and knowing that I like to just keep throwing out ideas, um, I'm going to end this now and kind of hopefully we can get a discussion um, of this. Okay. Yes, and also along with um, someone's uh, Leslie talking about students falling apart during Ramadan, um, I think there needs to be more reaching out to regular, um, regular like uh, to all instructors about what Ramadan is and what that is, what additional things are happening to students uh, for during um, that time for students. All right. So I, I don't. What is the best way? Thank you. So, um, oh, okay. Thank you. So I'd, I'd love to hear uh, what other people are doing, um, questions, anything like that. And I don't know, yes. Melissa, last time you kind of read stuff out. Yeah, we can uh, we can <laughs> open it up for questions and, and you can just unmute if you'd like to ask something. A lot of things were going on in the chat, just discussions. Yeah, I know, I was trying not to be too distracted, so, but yeah. Yeah, it was, great stuff it, was it was really great. Uh, yeah. And so if anyone wants to follow up on any of those, um, those things in the chat or ask a new question feel free to just unmute unmute and, and say it yeah yes <clears throat> hi this is helen i have a question about the global list of topics i really <clears throat> love that uh, so I was wondering how you came up with the list and if we can have a copy of the list. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think it's accessible through the, the PowerPoint that you should be able to click on that and access it. Um, we came about a couple different ways. I mean, first couple of semesters, I went and um, I would I, I sent out a message to all the faculty. So what topics, because this makes it easy for me because it's not, it's low work for me. Um, but it's also, I think it's more engaging when it's faculty in, in different subject areas. And so what kind of stuff would you like to talk about from a global perspective? So if people from like the business office want to know, you know the business department want to know certain things, or uh, we had linguistics professor who talked about who wanted a different topic. So sometimes the professors came up with the topics and said that that's what they want to do. Other times my student uh, peer mentors brainstormed ideas. The video gaming one was really fun because there are some weird games out there that you never, you know, like, yeah, you know, it, it, it was really fun. So um, it, it's kind of a combination of, of both. And, and we've done both a discussion kind of thing. Um, and then we've also done more where students would do short presentations just with some quick PowerPoint slides. But it's been real. I, I also provide pizza. So I have to give that little caveat. And I do have a lot of faculty that will make it either a required um, for them students to go to at least one global dialogue per semester because I do three per semester. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just, it's kind of grown. I mean, we've gotten as many as like 75 people there and we invite staff and faculty as well. So it's been a really like a safe place for students to kind of share their experiences and perspectives. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. 
And there was a question in the chat about students using photographs to tell their own stories through the photographic mm -hmm. essay and um, speaking a little bit perhaps about the tech aspect of that. Yeah. Is it, do you keep it more low tech, high tech, and are you teaching those things or do students? Oh come yeah, in? Good, good question. So I've taught um, how to use Adobe Express. I actually, I've, well, I've had the librarian come in and talk about it and talk about copyright and things, but um, but I know it now. So I've, I teach how to use Adobe Express and we all spend a class period learning how to do it. It's super easy to paste photos in that way. I actually, um, if you go to the, if you go to the Penn State Brandywine's webpage and click on international students, my page has links to a few of the, of the, um, the, uh, the, the websites that students have made. Um, so I, I publish them on our website. Um, yeah. So uh, that's, I don't know. That's 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 one way to it, it. I teach it, and it's really simple. And this generation, I'm they're they're really you know it's it's very click click click. It's pretty easy, and there are a lot of tutorials out there. But I mean, you could certainly do something as basic as here's a PowerPoint, stick a photo up on this, you know, and just share, just put that on behind you, you know. But I and I saw a question about um, adult. I, I'd love to hear what other people's ideas are about low, low like lower proficiency adult learners. <clears throat> oh, I'm seeing there's numbers. The chat's popping up with something. Let's see. Huh. Oh, there, cool. Uh, adult ELs at lower levels of proficiency. Anyone have suggestions? Or... Hmm. Um, I have done um, back in my um, back in my. Uh, um, the, I, I've done in, in the past when I do work with adult learners, I think like a very basic like newsletter kind of thing um, has been, yeah, I've done something like that before, but um, I don't know. I'd love to hear if anybody else, any other adult teachers, adult learner instructors in there? Hmm. Well, maybe somebody will put that in the chat. I, I work with higher level adult students. Hmm. Uh, they're, they're more interested in uh, the academic writing and the different types of essays because uh, mm. they're preparing either um, they're, they're preparing their writing for furthering their education for post-secondary education or um, or mm. for work um, so I have a question about that like um, I like the the uh, slide where you listed all the different types of writing the different types of essays mm -hmm. so I was wondering if your students lean towards one type like is it more persuasive writing or narrative writing or process writing do they have a preference uh, when they are given a choice or well i mean for, for that one that's for uh, some of those that i listed were in my um freshman composition course and so with the freshman composition like we're doing like five essays in the course of semester either each one's a different style and they have they have choices and all and i have had them write reflective essays and it is pretty they all have different ones that are their favorite. Like, I, I can't say that one's a clear, I, I guess the photo essay would be the one that they tend to love the most because they get to read each other's and see all the pictures and all that fun stuff. So um, photo essay sometimes turns out to be the, the most favorite, but I have them actually incorporate outside sources in their photo essays. We use like, they need to have like three outside facts to kind of whatever they're like I had a student she wrote about how she's Mongolian and Colombian and so she feels like the whole world is her home like she doesn't feel like she has one country and so as she wrote that she was included some information about I think she had how many you know unlike 82 percent of the world that has never flown on a plane or she put something about you know how many she had a lot of statistics and things that she would put in there um, about um, imposter syndrome and things that you would weave in. So you could use like a photo essay and still incorporate some research, you know, if you, if you wanted to do that. Um, but that, I guess that was kind of their favorite. Um, and I'm also thinking back, um, I, I, I was a very, very low level Chinese, uh, in an in introductory Chinese course one semester when we started getting Chinese students like crazy on campus. And um, one thing that I really enjoyed for my very low level class was that we had to do a very simple PowerPoint introducing us our, ourselves to the class and you know it's like here's my pet here's my kid you know that kind of stuff and that was really fun to get to know everyone in the class so I mean I guess that's one you know finding that's that's one thing if, if you have the I don't know what the adult learners if you always have the tech for that or if they could even just submit I, I don't know, but if you had the tech for that, that was a fun one. Yeah. 
With the low level adult learners, uh, one of our teachers uh, um, worked on an, um, on a writing, on, on a piece of writing where uh, it is like a fill in the blank. So she gave them a basic paragraph uh, with uh, where they can fill in the blanks and she provided <clears> them <throat> with a word bank. And the purpose was that to be able to choose the words that would you know, go to fill in the blanks and also to introduce them to the sentence structure and you know, like uh, uh, you know, uh, punctuation and capitalization and spelling and things like that. So they uh, filled in the blanks. So they came up with a par with you know, they they completed the paragraph. Then they wrote the paragraph uh, mm -hmm. again to practice, you know, the structure of the paragraph. And then they presented the paragraph, and it was about my country. So the teacher helped them in sharing the screen. That was all on Zoom, and then. Uh, they, they, they saw the map of their country and they would give more information, like they would read the paragraph and then they would give more information about their country, very basic information. So they were like the experts about their country in, in that area and then shared photos from Google about the country. So that was a very successful writing um, activity with the beginner, lower intermediate learners, adult learners. Awesome, thank you for, thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I also I'm remembering an assignment my son did uh, a freshman in high school, but it was he had to he had to find five objects that were significant to him that like meant something to him there that represented him and like share a picture and tell why. So something like something very basic like that with bringing in an object or or, or something along those lines, I, I would think might work at a lower level, um, you know, kind of sounds like show and tell a little bit, I guess, but it, it is personal. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But that's not my, I haven't taught in that level in a very long time. So I'm not an expert on that. I use a lot of visuals too, you know, advertisements, just photographs and have them write a little bit about what do you see? And we can talk about things in the past or the present, the future, et cetera, sort of work on different aspects of verb usage and applications of context and, and so forth. But the use of an image or also a process. So for example, I'll show like a recycling sort of from the different steps of recycling in, a, in an image and have them describe, okay. So it's this idea of, of transitioning and vocabulary and verb tense and so forth. So the lower level students often like some of that practice. I usually do like two sort of pieces of information and then they apply it. I have this rule of two <laughs> that I like to use to get them working constantly. Well, thank you so much, Deb. That was wonderful. And um, I have linked in the chat her PowerPoint as well as um, Keith's modified one. So those are both in the chat if you're interested in checking those out. And, and we are right on time. So we're going to go ahead and, and move to our next invited speaker, which will be Ken Highland. And Leslie Krishner Morris will go ahead and do a brief introduction. And then um, we'll continue on if anyone needs to kind of take a break feel free to just shut your camera off and still listen in if you need like a second. I know we're back to back today. So thank you for uh, hanging in there. Leslie? Thank you, Melissa. Wow, Deb, that was phenomenal. This, this conference, this little conference should be attended by so many more people. And uh, we hope that you'll share all the riches that uh, you're gaining today from the conference in terms of the recordings that will be on our website and the PowerPoints that you've gained and just anything that has stood out for you uh, from today, from Deb's presentation or uh, Dr. Falsey's presentation and now the upcoming presentation that uh, many of us have been super excited and waiting for as well is coming from uh, Dr. Ken Highland from the University of East um, Anglia. Anglia? Yes. All right. So just a little bit of, uh, of a bio from uh, Dr. Highland. Uh, Dr. Highland is the honorary professor uh, at the University of East Anglia. I'm sure he'll tell us a little bit about it. Um, he was previously a professor at the University of College London at the U. EA and the University of Hong Kong. He's best known for his research into academic uh, discourse and writing, having published a mere 280 articles and 29 books on these topics with over 69,000 
citations on Google Scholar, if you can wrap your arms around that one. A collection of his work was published as The Essential Highland uh, in 2018 by Bloomsbury Press. He's the editor of two book series with Bloomsbury and Rutledge mm -hmm. and founding uh, co-editor of the Journal of English for Academic Purposes and co-editor of Applied Linguistics. And his topic today is Teaching ESL Writing Three Perspectives. We're so excited to have you with us, Dr. Highland, and uh, I'll turn the program over to you. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Off I go. Uh, thanks, Leslie, for the introduction. Thanks to Melissa for inviting me and thanks to everyone for, to, uh, for coming to my talk. Um, okay. Uh, I've got a, this is a, a, a public health warning, first of all. My talk is very different to the last one, okay? I'm not such an engaging speaker as Deb and um, the content is, is going to be very different. I'm I'm not going to give you advice on what to you might ways you might teach. I'm going to kind of give you some um, options um, that you might reflect on and see how they might work out in your own um, your own context. Okay, let's. Uh, oh, I've got to share the screen and. Um, 